Parks Building, again, awaiting the uh, start of this this uh, hearing on the subcommittee, Natural Resources Subcommittee, looking at the President's Wildlife Refuge Plan. Again, if you're just joining us, we're waiting for the start of this House hearing on the National Wildlife Refuge System Improvement Act. It was passed 10 years ago dealing with issues such as oil and gas development. They're going to hear from Bruce Babbitt and others. Ron Kind of Wisconsin is actually uh, chairing this particular subcommittee hearing. He just took his jacket off. Looks like they're about ready to get underway. We're live here on C-SPAN 2. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh Mr. Young, thank you for joining us. I want to thank you all, and I want to apologize. We had a little mechanical problem with the plane coming in today, but we are here safe now and ready to kick off the hearing. And I'm honored to be able to, you know, chair this uh, committee hearing today about the status of our refuge system coinciding with the 10-year anniversary of the Refuge Improvement Act. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years already, but not only giving us a chance to look back, but also a chance to look forward on where we're going to go from here as a nation and as an institution in our support of these tremendously valuable public lands uh, called the National Wildlife Refuge. I, uh, earlier in the session of Congress, uh, helped form a bipartisan caucus with our good friend Jim Saxton, who's also on the committee, along with Mike Castle, Mike Thompson, to have the first ever Congressional Wildlife Refuge Caucus in order to uh, attract more attention and more focus on the status of refuges and what we need to be working in a bipartisan fashion to uh, support a very valuable system. I do have a written statement that I'd like to, uh, without objection, submit for the record, but especially want to welcome uh, our panel of guests uh, uh, today, starting with Secretary Babbitt. Uh, he was here and very instrumental in helping to shepherd through the Improvement Act in 97, the first real organic act for our refuge system, and did a tremendous job in his stewardship of uh, the Secretary of Interior during the Clinton administration, along with the other guests who will be represented in the second panel. But let me just say there are some very, I think, positive things that are going on with the refuge system. All too often we hear some of the reports and studies coming out talking about the shortfalls and the resources uh, strap and what's not getting done. But for someone who represents an area of western Wisconsin has, I think, and I'm biased, three of the most beautiful wildlife refuges in the nation, the Upper Miss Wildlife, the Trempolo, and also the Nasita and having a chance to visit them and others in the country. I'm always very impressed with the quality of professionalism from the managers, the officers, the staff of the refuge. You can feel their passion and energy every time you step on those refuges and listen to the work that they're doing and the impact they're having in the community and with the people, not to mention uh, the wildlife that depend on those refuges. I think uh, it's exciting seeing the Refuge Association and the Friends Group and the volunteers that come in to offer their help and assistance. Uh, uh, certainly they're, they're valuable resources for the wildlife that depend on it, the quality water supplies, which is essential uh, for this nation. 
the educational opportunities that have really been ramped up to in recent years. I think the outreach campaign, and I'm going to ask, I think, Mr. Hall, uh, a little more information from you during your testimony of what we're doing to tap into the youth of our country to get them more involved in outdoor recreation generally, but also uh, the education of the refuge system uh, more specifically. But of course, we do have you know other very important reports, Refuges at Risk, the latest uh, 2007 report, talking about some of the shortfalls in regards to operation and ma maintenance uh, budget, uh, some of the staff reduction that's occurred, some of the quasi-mothballing of, uh, of some of the refuges that have taken place because of the limitation of resources. We did have a nice ramp up in funding, I felt, leading up to the 2003 centennial anniversary of the refuge system, but since then it's been relatively flatlined. And I'm happy that with this uh, next fiscal year's uh, interior appropriation bill, working closely with uh, Norm Dix on the subcommittee, that we've had the first significant increase in funding for the refuge system in a number of years. Uh, we're just trying to play catch up right now. Hopefully we'll be able to convince the president and the administration that this is the right type of investment that we have to make. I know there are some uh, funding issues and threatened vetoes out there, but this is something I think we have to come together on. Um, we also face you know, a serious risk in regards to global warming and the impact that's going to have in the refuge, the ecosystem, but also the, the habitat and wildlife uh, that depend on these re refuges and how we're going to combat that. We've had a virtual freeze and new funding for uh, new buildings uh, uh, recently. It's been very difficult to move forward and hopefully we'll have some perspective on the state of our infrastructure uh, in the refuge system and what we're, what we're facing there. So certainly we've had some big challenges. Um, uh, that, 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 can't be, uh, that can't be ignored. And also earlier this year we had the report from the Cooperative Alliance for Refuge Enhancement, the CARE report, again highlighting their survey and, and uh, the issues that they think that we have to be engaged in. So I think the, the hearing is very important. It's timely. It's 10 year anniversary. It also coincides nicely with National Refuge Week uh, this year. And we're bringing back some former alums uh, who have considerable expertise and dealing with refuge maintenance along with those who are currently serving our country. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, yield at this time my distinguished friend and colleague from Alaska, Mr. Young, for any opening statements that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would thank the Chairman Bortolo and, of course, the full chairman of the committee. Uh, at my request, this hearing is being held. I want to stress that because this hearing is about the state of our refugees and where we are going under the act that was passed 10 years ago, signed into law by President Clinton. It was landmark legislation then and is today. And very humbly, when you think about the beginning of the refuge system on Pelican Island, it was growing to 96 million acres. And I want to stress that 96 million acres is the total amount of acreage, which is a considerable amount of federally owned land. In my state of Alaska, we have 16 national wildlife refuges representing 76.2 million acres. So if you look at it, we have over 80 percent of the refuge lands in the state of Alaska, so I'm quite interested in this issue. These units allow hunting, fishing, and other forms of wildlife-dependent recreation. Prior to the Act, the individual refuge managers had little, if any, guidance as to what was compatible activity. There was no designated priority uses within the system, no ability to review existing activities prior to federal land acquisition. No, co no comprehensive inventory of the archaeological, natural resource, or wildlife resources values within each unit. I was the proud sponsor of this legislation and removed these shortcomings. There was a fundamental need to revitalize the refuge system, to end arbitrary or inconsistent compatibility determinations, to establish priority uses and to respect historic activities occurring on private lands. Getting this legislation enacted was a long and difficult journey. It took more than three years and months to intend of intensive negotiations. I'm pleased that some of these people are still here. The organizations who were partners in the process are testifying today. It's also remarkable this bill passed both the House, and I say this for your benefit, and the Senate with only one dissenting vote. It is now appropriate, appropriate to reflect upon this act and examine the current state of the refuge system. I'm frankly amazed that not a single provision of this law has been changed. Apparently, we got it right, and the operation of the refuge system has improved. In fact, in the past 10 years, the number of refuge units have grown from 514 to 548. 
The amount of refuge lands have been increased by more than 3 million acres. Visitation, visitation has increased by more than 11 million people each year, and 317 of the 100, 452 open refuges allow hunting. And this is a historic level. In addition, the Fish and Wildlife Rep Service is working hard to complete the required comprehensive conservation plans. Why I stress the hunting aspect, Mr. Chairman, is the fact is that what is the original idea of the refuge and we're their biggest supporters. And to change that policy now or in a future date it would be wrong. Before blowing out the birthday candles over, we must acknowledge that funding for the refuge system is currently inadequate, and I'll be the first one to agree with that. But when you think you have 96 million acres of land, and I think we're generating $17 million, then that's not good management. We must figure out another way to help fund these refuge systems that serve so many people. We also recognize that a lot of the refuges, because of other acts of law, are being overgrown by foreign invasive species, and the maintenance backlog continues to grow at a staggering level. It's my hope that this hearing will be, will be just the first of a series of efforts to address these problems of true management of the refuge. Nevertheless, I would do welcome our distinguished witnesses, and my hope that we will continue to work together and the only thing I'd like to bring a little sour to when you bring and hold us up, Mr. Chairman, I think you also identify who wrote it, the Defenders of Wildlife. Yes, sir. We have a group of people in this room that do not believe in the refuge system as I vision it. They do not want any hunting or really recreational other than looking, and they want the government to control it. And when you do that, you lose the support of the people, you lose the intent of what the refuge system was set up for. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Young, and I want to thank you personally, too, for your, your concern and interest and support uh, of the refuge system. You've been a real champion on this issue. And now we're going to turn to uh, our first witness today, uh, former Secretary Bruce Babbitt. On a personal note, you may recall or you may not that you were the first public official who came into my congressional district back in the 96 campaign to help me campaign, and we did a, an event in the Upper Miss Wildlife Refuge about the Environmental Management Program, which of course is spearheaded by USGS, and I enjoyed that uh, thoroughly. Of course, you were uh, the principal architect of the Improvement Act of 97, uh, very fully engaged in helping shepherd that through uh, the Congress, and now we sit here 10 years later uh, to look back and, and see what's worked, what hasn't, and where we need to go from here. So it's a great honor to be able to welcome back to the committee uh, here today uh, Secretary Babbitt, Thank you. I think everyone's familiar with the, the lighting system that we have here in the committee, the five-minute rule. The rest assured all your written statements will be fully submitted uh, for the record. So thank you, Secretary Babbitt, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. from that first uh, visit and my clairvoyant judgment that you would uh, rise to uh, an outstanding role uh, in this body. Uh, Mr. Young, I recall the hearing that gave rise to uh, this legislation. I recall it as uh, a somewhat contentious and unproductive hearing, which uh, was followed by a discussion that we had uh, uh, in your office, uh, which resulted in my recognition that I would have to uh, deal with the forces of darkness uh, uh, led by my good friend, uh, Mr. Horn. Uh, and uh, get uh, all of the stakeholders um, into this process. Uh, and as you yourself have said, uh, it's quite extraordinary, the degree of consensus and the fact that 10 years later uh, there have been uh, uh, no amendments uh, necessary for the bill. As I reread the legislation in the report last night, uh, what comes back quite clearly is the three-cornered premise of this bill. First of all, a strong mission definition. Uh, secondly, a strong statement of compatibility that any use of the refuge uh, had to be compatible with that primary mission. Um, and third, the mandate for comprehensive conservation plans, which would provide the public input and the analytical framework for making uh, these compatibility decisions. I think it's all worked uh, quite well. I think the most interesting example of that is a recent court decision uh, on the Little Ponderé uh, National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Washington, uh, in which uh, Judge Stevens uh, analyzes the act, uh, affirms this kind of triangular structure, and uh, strongly affirms the compatibility a decision made uh, by the refuge manager. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have alluded, uh, both you and Mr. Young, to the budget shortfall issues, and I uh, won't add anything to that. I have uh, something to say uh, in my testimony. Um, it's getting pretty desperate out there. I think the staff reductions are uh, uh, ominous. Uh, and it's also slowing the completion of the comprehensive conservation plans. Uh, the compatibility decisions are not going to be well made, and they may not survive judicial scrutiny unless they are made by managers in the context of the analytical framework uh, of those plans. Um, only a third of the plans have been done in 10 years. The deadline is five years away. We still have uh, two-thirds of the plans to go. Uh, it's important, and as Mr. Young says, we must find some way to resolve that issue. Uh, I would like to uh, devote my remaining one minute and 54 seconds to two minor topics, uh, global warming and land use. Uh, let me just say, with respect to global warming, uh, it's going to impact migratory species most ominously. That includes most of the waterfowl, which are uh, at the base of this refuge, in the refuges in Alaska, on the Pacific, the Atlantic Flyway, the Gulf, and the Mississippi River Flyway. Uh, if you look at the sea level rise maps, uh, get those maps. EPA has put them out. Overlay them on two places, Pamlico Sound in North Carolina and the delta of the Mississippi River. You will see that by the middle to the end of this century on facts already in place, sea level rise, is simply going to erase a number of the units in the refuge system. We need to begin a process of systematically analyzing that, because the whole refuge system uh, is an enormous risk. Uh, let me conclude uh, with just one example uh, that I happen to have uh, been involved in very recently. Uh, uh, it is of uh, the Pocosin Lakes National uh, Wildlife Refuge and the, the refuge complex on Pamlico Sound. Uh, if you look at the EPA maps and the current consensus estimates of sea level rise, uh, half of that 100,000 acre refuge will be gone in this century. Uh, Pea Island uh, is likely to perish, as are uh, areas uh, in the Outer Banks. Now, what that means is we're going to have to come to grips with how these refuges migrate along with the coastal ecosystems of which they are a part. I don't have a lot of answers, but we haven't even started asking the questions. Now, to make matters worse, as I uh, conclude, uh, in North Carolina, uh, the Navy selected the western margin of that refuge for an outlying landing field. It was a decision. Uh, not made with careful analysis. There are many alternatives. The landing field has been opposed by most of the North Carolina delegation, by the governor, uh, and it has now come uh, before this Congress uh, in footnotes to the appropriations bill. Uh, the reason I cite that is because it's a perfect example of the land use conflicts that we're going to see as these refuge systems uh, begin, or at least the wildlife, begin either to migrate uh, with the shifting coastlines uh, or uh, to perish or at least uh, uh, be in risk of, of extinction. Uh, that underlines my final point. Even as we expand them as we must, most of the wildlife refuges outside of Alaska are postage stamps on large landscape ecosystems. And they are continually going to be threatened by growth, development, inconsistent uses, unless we find some way of engaging states and local governments in comprehensive, state-centered land use planning with the refuges uh, in mind. Uh, I would leave uh, for your consideration some other interesting federal examples, the Coastal Zone Management Act which has a state-federal process. Uh, you should look at the wildlife action plans, uh, which have induced the states to begin that process. Uh, but I would conclude by saying 
Uh, we could do a much more robust statutory and budget job of looking beyond the borders of these refuges at the changes that are going to take place and finding inventive ways to engage states, local communities, and the Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, Service uh, in looking uh, ahead for the next century. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. And I'd be remiss if I also did not extend her greetings to you. Chairwoman Bordalo desperately wanted to be here. She's en route from Guam, but wanted to express her uh, 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 welcome uh, to you here today, too. Let me just follow up with you, uh, if I may, on uh, the whole phenomenon of global warming, the impact it's going to have on the refuge system. And now, as an outside observer with the service and, and the management of these refuges, do you feel that there are sufficient steps being taken uh, in light of the science and the impact it, it, it's going to have on, on the refuge uh, within the service itself, management plans, or, or does something structural have to the change within the service itself in order to uh, put together the planning and, and the comprehensive analysis that you were just talking about? Mr. Chairman, I think there has to be a structural change. Uh, the pervasive nature of these changes is such that they really can't be adequately addressed, although they should be analyzed, in the uh, comprehensive conservation plans. Uh, the service must have a mandate and the resources, for example, uh, to look at the entire uh, region of Pamlico Sound, uh, Florida Bay, the Gulf Coast, the Atlantic Coast. They're all related. And uh, we haven't even begun to comprehend that. There are uh, some extraordinary examples in Alaska. Uh, the retreat uh, of the Arctic ice cap has now moved sufficiently far uh, off the Beaufort Sea shoreline uh, that, that there's every reason to think that the polar bear population uh, will, in fact, diminish, and that the only possibility for maintaining uh, that population on some semblance of a land ice bridge is going to be in the uh, ANWR, the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, uh, and we need serious attention to those issues. Mr. Secretary, the, the structural changes that you'd like to see, is that something that can be done internally, uh, or is it something that the Congress needs to be engaged in in order to provide the uh, statutory authority or the mandate uh, to do? Well, Mr. Chairman, I spent uh, the better part of eight years up here uh, answering that question by saying, uh, leave it to the bureaucrats, of which I am one. Uh, I return now as a private citizen and an uh, environmental we concern private citizen to say that uh, a congressional mandate would be much the preferable way. This is a large issue. It is a systemic issue uh, with uh, catastrophic potential consequences, and it should not be left uh, to uh, Mr. Hall, his successor, uh, Secretary Kemp Thorne, or his successor, whoever they might be. Thank you. Um, before coming out here uh, this morning to catch the flight, I was out. Uh, observing the great migration that's taking place in the Upper Miss right now, and it's spectacular and it's, it's beautiful. Uh, uh, but it's also daunting in regards to the management and the multiple uses of that vast area. And we've especially dealt with the difficulty of putting together a, a comprehensive conservation plan in light of the multiple uses for the Upper Miss, uh, uh, which has proven quite controversial, at least in the state of Wisconsin when it comes to certain access issues and what type of access that you're talking about. Now, we are obviously behind the timeline when it comes to the development of all the comprehensive plans uh, throughout the nation. Uh, do you have any specific recommendations what we need to do to try to streamline this process in order to get these plans done and up and going uh, at a much quicker pace than what we've seen so far? Mr. Chairman, I believe the baseline issue is funding. Uh, I don't think that there are any significant shortcuts, and I would, uh, be, I would be very skeptical of any response which says uh, we'll simply accelerate our effort uh, and start cranking them out. Uh, they take time and resources, and they can't be done on a refuge which has, you know, at most one or two personnel, uh, where, you know, the visitor center isn't open most of the time, where uh, trash is piling up invasive species are running wild, where 
there's not a semblance of the resources necessary to do their, their day jobs, much less uh, undertake uh, this kind of planning regime. Uh, the plans are good. They work. They're worth doing. Uh, the uh, court decision in the Little Pond Array uh, ought to be a reminder of the importance of this. You mentioned in, in your testimony about some of the land use conflicts and how that might uh, slow the process down a little bit. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in order for the CCPs to, to work, you got to have maximum buy-in, not only from those in charge of putting the plans in place, but the input from the community at large. Because a lot of this is going to be self-enforcing. We just won't have the resources in order to go out there unless you have that buy-in from the larger community and the multiple uses of the refuge. Do you have anything in particular that you'd recommend in order to deal with the, uh, the, the land use conflicts or the multiple use conflicts that, that pop up from time to time without jeopardizing the consensus building that has to take place at the end of the day? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think the service has done a good job on the public involvement that is mandated by the Act. I think that what we ought to be working on is statutory ways to give incentives to state, county, and municipal governments, not mandates. Uh, but uh, there are a, a number of interesting examples. Coastal zone management is one that I referred to, uh, in which we look out across those boundaries and invite the state governments and the local governments. Uh, another way that could be done uh, would be to put uh, some language into the wildlife uh, action plans. Uh, it's been an enormously successful program. This, it has brought, I forget the exact name of it, it's a state grants program, has brought the states into, most all states, into very high quality wildlife analysis and mapping across the states. I think it would be perfectly logical to revisit that and say, here's an extra add-on to the extent that you want to get into looking at land use uh, in connection with the refuge managers. Uh, just set up the process and give the incentives. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time's expired. We'll turn it over to Mr. Young for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kine. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you hit upon the funding and cooperation um, and suggested that Congress come forth with possibly a solution instead of the bureaucrats. And I might agree with that, but knowing this Congress, we haven't been able to do a whole lot in the last year and a half, uh, and I don't know how much more we're going to be doing. Um, and this is realistic. And I don't know whether we can solve the funding. And, and I, I mentioned in my statement, uh, Mr. Secretary, we have 96 million acres in refuges. And it's my understanding we raise $17 million a year off the 96 million um, acres. Is there any way we can use the 96 million in acres to raise more money for the refuge system? Um, Mr. Young, I have always been an advocate of visiting and revisiting uh, the issue of uh, fees. Uh, I wouldn't advocate fees for the Alaska refuges. It costs more to collect them than they'd be worth. Uh, if you go down to Sanibel Island uh, during uh, the winter season down there, uh, I don't know whether they're charging uh, admission fees. It's not, a, it's not a total solution, but uh, it has been helpful in my judgment. Uh, in the national park system, and I think it should be uh, uh, carefully examined here. Well, uh, going along those lines, though, if if we have a refuge, if just raising by fees, um, that's just a minor amount of money. If we thought if we had 11 million more visitors a year, you'd have to be charging something like um, a hundred dollar fee or better for those that visit. To raise the money, we're about a 2.4 billion dollar backlog, if I'm not mistaken. So, I, what I'm looking for, and I hate, I hate, I'm not a pessimist, but I don't see there's other than this hearing much enthusiasm for the refuge system in the United States Congress. There's a little talk, there's a little bit of a discussion, but not much enthusiasm. And we, as I mentioned, invasive species, everything else, and if we go, if we buy your concept of tidal uh, or rising tide, and we have to. Uh, adjust the borders of the refuge to make sure they have enough space for the migratory birds and stuff, that's going to take money. And somehow we've got to figure out 
how we're going to raise that money or raise the interest level higher um, to uh, to get it. I, I I still think you know what happens to our uh, duck stamp money? Where does that go? Does uh, it go? What's it go for? Does anybody uh, know? It goes largely, in my understanding, for habitat acquisition in the duck factory region. But not management of, of the refuge. Right. And we've, we've increased, like 96 million acres, we probably could get more. I, everybody, I would not support that, but say somebody else would, because I believe if you have the inability to manage the property you have, then you shouldn't be purchasing another house. You should take and make sure your house is being run correctly. So I've got to figure out a way we can get the monies other than a direct appropriation, you can forget that. There's just not going to be 2.4 billion additional dollars for the backlog. So we've got to figure out a way to raise those dollars. And if anybody's got any suggestion, and for those that are going to testify later on, you better be thinking about it, because I'll probably ask the same question if I'm here. So I'm, I'm just, Mr. Secretary, I'm, you're at disadvantage now, because I don't, no one's came to me how we're going to do it, raise those dollars. Mr. Young, I would only suggest that you uh, might talk with, I think, the two most creative sort of indirect fundraisers uh, in or from the United States Congress, John Bro and Mary Landrieu, who have, uh, in aid of coastal issues in Louisiana, come up with imaginative proposals tapping everything that stands or moves within the jurisdiction of not just Louisiana, but the entire United States. Well, I'd be supportive because that's oil and gas. I didn't want to bring that subject up, but that's exactly where it's coming from. And if you remember the CARA Act, which I was the sponsor of Mr. Miller, that's what we were going to do to make sure those monies were permanently appropriated and not, and not at the discretion of the appropriators for uh, Conservation Reinvestment Act. And of course, it got over to the Senate and died. By the way, that was a, we had 328 votes, I believe, for that act. Uh, and that does show some imagination. But and else we see the interest that I can't get your side to even think about offshore drilling others in Louisiana. Um, and we might want to start thinking about maybe we have some, oh, God help us, oil and gas development that a, a, a set, a portion of that of money would go directly to the refuge uh, improvement and maintenance of and, and the future development of, of, of supposedly global warming. We might want to think about that. That may be a little far-fetched, but you know, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, every time I mention that, oh, we can't do that. That's dirty old fossil fuels. We can't develop it. But if we want to solve this problem of refuge, which does exist today, and if we're really interested in fish and wildlife and recreational purposes and touching nature, we better damn well accept that challenge. I'm out of time. Mr. Young, may I offer a brief rejoinder and suggestion? Yes. In the spirit of our earlier collaboration, um, I believe where those concepts detached from all of the raging debates about where development should take place, and that were cut adrift and you were just examining the issue of revenues as they may come under, under law, whatever that law may be, uh, that would be an opportunity for you and me to go back to your office and write a bill. Unfortunately, I am no longer empowered to do that. Mr. Chairman, in, in, in response, Mr. Babbitt, Secretary Babbitt, a little story, and he may deny this because the media is in the room, but he was, when he was Secretary, he came to my office again and asked for assistance to help rewrite the Endangered Species Act. And we were working on that and making progress. And lo and behold, in 94, we took over control of the Congress, and I tried to rewrite the act, and all of a sudden, I was a bad guy. Uh, no politics involved, but I just want to tell you what can happen in this business we're in. Uh, I'd be willing to sit down and talk to anybody if we can find a way to, to find a permanent source of income so it doesn't go through the appropriation process for the improvement in the, in the, the management of our refuges, and I think that's what we ought to be saying. Well, seeing. thank you, Mr. Young. And, uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to just follow up with a couple more questions, mainly on that line of thought, because I've been talking to a lot of individuals and a lot of groups on this very point and try to see what creative minds exist out there to have this steady, dedicated source of income. You, you, you raise the duck stamp uh, money that's uh, raised every year, yet you're talking about a very limited 
universe there of duck hunters that are actually contributing to it. And they are a very small percentage of those who are actually going into the refuges to enjoy that hunting sport. I'm one of them. Uh, and yet we have a lot of birders going in, uh, bird watchers, photographers going into our refuge system uh, that aren't buying duck stamps at the same time. And the duck stamp money is mainly for wetlands preservation uh, programs, both on public and private lands. Uh, so we do have to think, come up with a different uh, funding source, a user fee, but this is also a question maybe the second panel or anyone on the second panel might have some ideas or thoughts on too, is how can we you know, raise some additional revenue from a dedicated uh, fee or, or source in order to deal with this backlog problem that we have right now in financing the, the refuge system. And I'm glad to hear that your office is open as mine is, you know, for you, Mr. Babbitt, or anyone else who has some ideas or thoughts on this very topic. But I would just disagree with you slightly, Mr. Young, in regards to the level of interest in the refuge system in the Congress. With, with the bipartisan caucus that we formed, we do have 138 members. Uh, so we're able to get information into the offices. We just haven't had your leadership on the caucus yet uh, that, yeah, we desperately, there's, there's a reason. that we desperately of, need. <laughs> Chairman, a lot of times these caucuses, you know, people get on it, because I'm the head of the Sportsman's Caucus, or was. As you know, people get on it, say they're on it. They're but, really not there to do anything, and that frustrates me. But, but granted, uh, but it is a, a truism in this place that there's virtually a refuge in every congressional district, or at least one within hiking distance of every congressional district. So it does affect us all, and I think we have to figure out a way of tapping into the, uh, the interest that does exist uh, in the Congress. But let me also ask you, Mr. Babbitt, an another very important issue. We've had a, uh, a hearing on this already, and that's the spread of invasive species. And obviously global warming is going to bring a whole new dynamic to that. I have pending before this committee, and we hope to go to full committee markup, H.R. 767 called the Repair Act, which will provide federal grants and, and a partnership, public and private level, in order to deal with the spread of invasive species in and also in the surrounding area of our refuge system. How big a threat uh, is that, and, and do we need a, a, a statutory response uh, to authorize the service in order to form these partnerships with the local entities in order to have a, a good comprehensive plan and also hopefully the funding uh, to, uh, to deal with the invasive problem that we have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think a, a statutory uh, directive would be uh, really uh, useful. This is a, a new and, again, uh, vast, poorly understood and hugely destructive problem that cannot be addressed just inside the boundaries of the refuge. And it is yet another example of how it is uh, driven by all these forces. We need uh, to find ways to sign up the uh, surrounding jurisdictions. And, and I believe it would be uh, uh, really important to flag that as a statutory uh, effort. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that because we've received a lot of good advice from Mr. Hall, Mr. Haskett, the chief here, uh, uh, in regards to the spread of invasive species. And while they do have programs in place, uh, it just seems to be out here rather than a real focal point or, uh, that I think we need and, and that's necessary. Of course, we do get back into the funding issue again, and all roads seem to head back to that, to that poignant fact. But again, I want to thank you, you know, for your insight and for your involvement and, and the history that you bring uh, to the refuge system and to this committee. And it's been a joy to have you here. Mr. Young, do you have any more questions for the Secretary? No, I, and I, you know, Mr. Secretary, I put your mind to work and maybe we can arrive at some solution to a problem. Uh, again, the financing is the hardest problem. I, I, although we have 130 on this deal, I. I'd be extremely surprised if we had more than 10 percent increase in the in the refuge dollars that are directly appropriated, and that's where CARA came in, where there was it was automatic and came off of the offshore drilling, and instead of where it goes now into the general treasury to be spent on some other crazy program uh, that never has any results at all, and I'm not casting aspersions to anybody, but in reality, if we, if we don't do that, if we don't take a resource and use it to develop an, and protect another resource, we're going to lose this battle eventually. Chairman, I suppose, uh, Mr. Young, I suppose that means I ought to go start talking to Mr. Horn again. Is that? Yeah. I, 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 Mr. Horn is not impossible. You know, I, I, he's not. He's, he's, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And now I'd like to uh, welcome our second uh, panel up to the microphones. While they're finding their seats, let me uh, just quickly uh, introduce them here this afternoon. Our, our second panel consists of the Honorable Carol Browner, the Chairwoman of the Board of Directors for the National Audubon Society and former Administrator of the U.S. Uh, EPA uh, during the Clinton Administration, uh, the Honorable Dale Hall, Director of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Department of Interior. Mr. Evan Hirsch, Executive Director, National Wildlife Refuge Association. Mr. John Frampton, Director of South Carolina, Department of Natural Resources. Welcome, glad to have you. And also the Honorable William Horn, General Counsel of U.S. Sportsmen's Alliance, former Chairman of the National Wildlife Refuge Centennial Commission and former Interior Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife uh, Parks. And I'd also just, since I see him sitting in the audience too, uh, Chief uh, Jeff Haskett uh, of the Refuge System. Delighted to have him here this afternoon as well. So, Ms. Bronner, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you again for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Congressman Young, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, while I am the former administrator of the EPA, I appear today as chair of the board of directors of the National Audubon Society. Uh, my testimony is offered not just on behalf of the National Audubon Society, it is also endorsed by the National Wildlife Federation, the Wilderness Society, and Defenders of Wildlife. Together, our organizations represent more than six million members and supporters across the country dedicated to wildlife and habitat conservation. Uh, you may be aware of this, but National Audubon has an extensive history of working to protect Americans, America's wildlife refuse, including from the very beginning, uh, our, our members actually urged President Teddy Roosevelt to create the refuge system and at the turn of the last century helped to provide some of the first wardens to protect the refuge from uh, the plume hunters. Audubon's 24 state offices and more than 500 local chapters across the country continue to provide volunteer support to the refuge nationwide. Mr. Chairman, I want to begin by thanking you for your leadership of the Congressional Wildlife Refuge Caucus and all of the members of that caucus. Uh, the question that you asked today, and I think the point of this hearing is uh, quite simply, has the promise of the act been fulfilled? And I think, unfortunately, and, and, and you noted there's, there's been some progress, but on balance, the answer is no. The promise has not been fulfilled. Ten years after passage of this landmark legislation, uh, we find that there are implementation of several key requirements that have really not been fully realized and that the result is that we are not living up to the sort of the hope and the intent of the legislation. Uh, we are particularly concerned with the low priority that has been given to implementing two of the key provisions. First, the mandate to direct strategic growth of the system to conserve the ecosystems of the United States. And second, the mandate to maintain adequate water quantity and water quality to fulfill the mission of the system and the purposes of each refuge. We share the concern that you spoke about with uh, Secretary Babbitt uh, as to the funding crisis, I think we would call it. Uh, we believe that this funding crisis has slowed conservation planning, limited even the most basic, basic monitoring of refuge resources, and severely limited the system's response to the highest priority threat to habitat, which are invasive species. And we certainly agree, Mr. Chairman, with your observation um, that sooner rather than later, uh, we're going to need to begin to account for the realities of climate change and the consequences that the refuge will uh, experience. A few thoughts as you go forward. Uh, first, Audubon strongly, strongly encourages further oversight from this committee. Now, that may sound a little odd from someone who spent eight years subject to the oversight of Congress, um, but I would encourage you to, to use that oversight. It can be a real, I think, help uh, to, to the agency uh, when the Congress can engage in, in that um, sort of way. I think looking at the strategic growth of the system, efforts to maintain adequate water for the refuge, and efforts to complete comprehensive conservation plans in a manner consistent uh, with the Act mandates would be particularly useful. We would also recommend that the committee consider passing legislation that would help the system to address the invasive species issues in the borderland conflicts. And 
particular, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you as well as Congressman Saxon for your leadership in, in introducing the Repair Act, which we think uh, would be extremely helpful in terms of uh, answering the invasive species challenge. And I understand that uh, the committee will look at that bill later this week, and we lend our support uh, to the passage um, of that. Uh, let me just say in closing uh, how important we think uh, your work is in looking at uh, where we are and what the 10 years have, have wrought and how much we um, are available to work with you as you move forward to address these concerns. Um, on a personal note, I come from Florida. As, as many of you know, I served as Secretary of the Environment in Florida and was part of an effort to expand the Big Cypress National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's an amazing place, and it meets a need of the public that sometimes our national parks don't. And I think it's, it's that uniqueness that we want to make sure we preserve going forward, but at the same, on the same hand, recognize that there are real challenges to preserving those opportunities that the refuse uh, provide to people across this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. I already spoke to Mr. Young, and he's in agreement. But to accommodate your schedule, Thank if it's you. all right, we'll go with uh, uh, questions here and then allow you to take off. Thank but you. Thank you for your testimony and, and for your service uh, to our nation as well and for your insight on these issues. Now, you mentioned uh, a few proposals, increased oversight, uh, invasive species, dealing with that adequately, any borderland conflicts that might exist. Help us try to prioritize a little bit. I mean, there's just a swath of issues and challenges that we're facing within the refuge. Have you had a chance to look at this and, and, and kind of delineate where well, the priorities or focus need to be? I think I would have to agree with, um, with Mr. Babbitt, um, money. Um, if, if we could find some more resources, I think that could be very, very helpful. I mean, I, 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 I trust that, that, that the, um, the, the personnel and the department is doing what they can with the resources they have, but, you know, certainly, and, and Mr. Young and, and, and Mr. Babbitt d discussed some ideas. It doesn't seem unreasonable to me, and I speak here personally, uh, that duck stamps, which I don't think the price has changed in a long time, uh, could, could be um, increased. I think they're $15 now, you know, something like $30. I mean, you know, whenever I used to set a, an environmental standard at EPA and someone would say, well, what's it going to cost a family? And you'd try and figure it out and then you'd compare it to, well, you know, that's less than going to the movies uh, with your family. That's less than having pizza or a Coke on, on Friday night with your family. And so the idea that we could charge a little more and see those resources brought to bear, uh, I, I think is, is well worth consideration. Great. Yeah, we, we were talking about the funding issue, too, with Mr. Babbitt, and we do have legislation pending that was started by uh, uh, Mark Kennedy, Mike Thompson, the last session that's carried over to actually increase the funding for or uh, mm -hmm. the fees for the duck stamp. But again, my concern is you're only talking about a very small percentage of the universe of users going into the refuge system, and now in your position heading up the Audubon Society, and there are many members who constantly go in and enjoy the use uh, of the refuge system. Do you have a sense within your own membership of, of, of what they would be supportive of in regards to new funding sources? That's one of the issues that I had raised, and I had actually had conversations with, I think, Mr. Hall, with you and maybe some others, was the concept of a new refuge stamp. But I don't want to do something that's going to cut into the, uh, the uniqueness or value of the duck stamp at the same time, uh, but something that I think bird watchers could also participate and start their own collection. and and purchase those if they knew that the funding was going to be dedicated for this very purpose? Um, I think from Audubon's perspective, we would be open to a conversation on that. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance, right? You don't want to discourage people from taking advantage of, of the resource, and so you want to be mindful of sort of what their economics are. On the other hand, you know, these are people who care passionately about uh, their, their morning bird walks and the opportunity to do that in these places. And, and so you know, we have found that when you can make a case to our membership about the benefits that will be derived uh, from a, some sort of increased fee, they, will, you know, they can be supportive of it. And, and finally, I mean, I have to say, I like your idea of something they can collect. I mean, most birders have a life list, right? I mean, these yes. are people who like to collect things and keep um, you know, a track of what, what's going on. And I think they could find it very attractive. But we'd be happy, uh, the Audubon staff, to, to work with you all to think about what our membership, which is, is quite large and, and, and is you know, all across the United States, what they would be willing to support. Well, I certainly think it might be wise for us to start conducting some surveys or some polls out there in the variety of groups, and I'd like to work with Mr. Young on this just to get some feedback from the general public of what they would find acceptable and willing to participate in as far as new revenue sources. Uh, we might even throw in a question as far as offshore drilling. Uh, 
uh, is concerned <laughs> too uh, in that uh, poll. There I have to put on my Florida hat. <laughs> <laughs> we have a particular feeling about that in my home state. Exactly. <laughs> Well, getting back to the, the, the strategic growth policy uh, for the refuge system that the service is in charge of now as far as implementation of the act, do you see any shortcomings as far as the implementation or things that, that can be done better? Well, I, I think it's important um, for any of these type efforts to sort of keep pace with the science and to keep pace with the times. And, and so I think your, your, your comments about climate change are, are particularly relevant as, as the system thinks about what has to happen today to protect the system and, and to meet the commitment and the mission of the system to preserve you know, wildlife and wildlife habitat, we're going to have to bring in the climate change issue. Because you, you could think of everything that's already been on the books and do a splendid job only to discover you know, 10, 15, 25 years from now, it didn't mean a lot. I, I think you're right. And I think this is where it gets particularly complicated or cumbersome when we talk about climate change is that when original refuges were established with certain habitat that supported certain species or wildlife may be undergoing great transformation and change, may, right. may not support it now because of global warming and climate change. And what is this going to do to the boundaries of these refuges where it may have made right. sense 50 years ago but may not make sense in the next 50 years that they continue to I, I think you're exactly right, and, and you know, I mean, I know of your particular interest in invasive species. Well, climate change is going to do probably very little to help us uh, solve the invasive species problem. In fact, it's probably going to make, in most areas, uh, the problem even more acute. And so as we start to think about, in the short term, the invasive species issues, we just need to be mindful of what is coming at us down the road. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I Time um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you if you'd like to get on HR 3735, it'd be 2735. It'd be very helpful. Um, this is a bill that raises money, and also uh, remember, I don't think just duck stamps are the solution to the problem because the duck hunter is the one that created the fund to, to purchase the land, and I believe you may have six million Ottoman society. They ought to pay. Anybody who uses any refuge land ought to pay if they want to keep the refuge. And anybody who doesn't want to pay, they're being outright selfish. Anybody who watches birds has got as much money as the duck hunter has. So that's just a little comment. But I have one, one request, Ms. Bauer, is um, in your, your testimony, you, you made a statement of, would you provide for me a complete list of the 2,376 what you call destructive uses of the wildlife refuges? We'd be happy to. Oh, good. Because I've, uh, I've talked to my refuge people themselves, and they don't know what you're talking about, okay. so I'd like to find out what it is. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Browner. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you again for your testimony and for your time here today. Next, we'll uh, hear from uh, Director Hall. Thank you, sir, for coming. And it's been a delight to be able to work with you on a variety of issues. And we look forward to your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you again. And Chairman Young, good to see you as well. I'd like to thank you for having this hearing. Uh, but mostly, I'd like to start off thanking all of you for the act. Uh, many of you were really involved in this years ago. And uh, members of Congress, uh, really helped us uh, get this sort of legislation, but we did it with, with friends as well. Uh, members of the administration, members of the uh, non-government organizations, et cetera. And uh, on behalf of everyone in the Fish and Wildlife Service, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, you know, starting from uh, our great president, Theodore Roosevelt, when he created Pelican Island in 1903 to where we are today with 548 national wildlife refuges encompassing over 96 million acres of land uh, that, that perform a myriad of services to fish and wildlife and, and to nature, uh, as well as over 280 endangered and threatened species, the system is a really good system. Uh, it's really important and it's unique in the world. And I think that we need to recognize that. I believe you do. Uh, but we need to keep reminding ourselves that nowhere else in the world is there anything like the National Wildlife Refuge System. But the act helped us to understand that it is a system it's not 548 independent entities, but one system trying to have a, a system of lands and waters uh, that help with uh, the conservation of fish and wildlife resources. The act envisions a collaborative approach 
And I believe that we have tried to do that with over 250 friends groups and 38,000 volunteers every year working with our friends in the states and in the non-government organizations as well as other federal agencies. And it also understood the importance of water. Um, uh, Carol Browner just mentioned water and I will tell you that I believe that water is the issue of the 21st century for everyone. Uh, not just fish and wildlife resources, but if we don't understand that fish and wildlife resources need a place at the table where water is being discussed, they won't have one and, and they will be the losers. With our state agency partners, uh, we've involved the public in CCPs and in uh, working together. State agencies are co-managers of the fish and wildlife resources in every state. And they have been tremendous partners and I'm sure you're going to hear from John Frampton in a few minutes on that. We have developed new policies uh, in compliance with the Act, uh, mission and goals and purposes, comprehensive conservation planning, appropriate uses, wildlife dependent recreation, habitat management planning, and biological diversity, integrity, and environmental health are completed now. And we're continuing to work on the uh, remaining policies that are, that are left to be done. And what these policies do is provide a refuge manager with a consistent approach, whether you're in Chesapeake Bay or San Francisco Bay. And I think that that's what we're after is consistency in a true system of lands and waters. We have completed 254 uh, CCPs uh, and we're well on, on underway in completing and I believe we will com uh, complete uh, all CCPs by the 2012 deadline. Uh, as the refuge system though has grown, so have the challenges. Uh, climate change is real. It, it is something that's affecting our refuges already and it is something that we need to uh, step up the pace in, in feeding them, uh, feeding the, the considerations into CCPs as we move forward. Invasive species. Uh, a decade ago when this law was being passed, uh, I doubt that avian influenza was even on anybody's mind as something that could affect the health of a refuge. But we have West Nile virus, uh, uh, poop, purple loose strife, and all a myriad of other invasive species that we need to, to work with. And climate change again may help uh, uh, speed that along and create the, a harder problem for us to deal with if we're not ready for it. Population growth <clears throat> has been on everyone's mind, but uh, for the National Wildlife Refuge System in particular along the southwest border is a real issue uh, where illegal immigration uh, is coming across the border and uh, on our National Wildlife Refuges in one year last year, we apprehended 100,000 people. That's apprehensions. That's not total number that went across. That's the, that's the number we caught. And the, the, uh, the, the trashing of the environment that's taking place is just something we have to address. And a lot of this is in designated wilderness area. And the, the uh, last thing I'll say ab about the future challenges is our own children. Uh, we have too many children that sit in front of computers and play Game Boys and use iPods and believe that real nature is watching the animal channel and we need to get them outside. We need to connect them with nature and we believe the National Wildlife Refuge System is a premier place to do that. The way that we uh, look at that strategic growth in the service, uh, we have developed a tool that we call strategic habitat conservation. It builds on the principles of, uh, e of ecological uh, planning, management and development and it looks at the objectives we want to achieve, a design to achieve those objectives then the implementation of those objectives and then the monitoring uh, and evaluation to see if, if we met those objectives and if we were correct and make the adjustments. It is a, a very formal form of adaptive management, but it is an excellent tool using structured decision making as well to help us decide where the right places are. We're very good at creating wetlands and creating habitats. We're not very good at saying where and how much. And that's what strategic habitat conservation is going to try and help us do. Um, you know, we need to look at the entire refuge system in the broader context of the landscape, especially in, in the lower 48. A refuge is not an island. It fits into the landscape ecology with state ma managed lands and with private lands. And if we're going to take care of the resources and fulfill the promise for the future, uh, we need to leave more than just what's in public ownership. We're going to have to work with the private landowners who are very ready and willing but just need some incentives and need some help. And I believe that that is just as important to the refuge system uh, as trying to understand what we need to do on our own lands. Because we can't be hypocrites and say we won't do it but we want you to do it.
So I think that we all need to be on the same page on what a landscape needs. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my comments and I look forward to the questions and thank you very much for holding this hearing. Great, thank you, Director Hall, and thank you and also Mr. Haskett for your, uh, your service and stewardship of our refuges in this country. Next, we're gonna to turn to Evan Hershey, Executive Director of the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Welcome. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. On behalf of the Refuge Association and uh, uh, our membership comprised of current and former refuge professionals, more than 140 refuge friends affiliate organizations and thousands of refuges, uh, refuge supporters around the United States. Uh, we really do uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Refuge Improvement Act. And I also wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on the caucus. Uh, I think this is one of the most tremendous events that we've uh, witnessed for refuges and support of refuges uh, recently, and, uh, and it's growing and it's an exciting uh, movement that we are pleased to help support. Uh, the Refuge Association strongly supports the Refuge Improvement Act and the intent of its authors to ensure the refuge system is prepared to address conservation challenges in a consistent and comprehensive manner. Nevertheless, we're alarmed both by the lack of adequate funding to achieve even the most minimal guidance in the act and the failure uh, to implement key provisions uh, by the Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today we face perhaps the greatest uh, challenges ever to the conservation of wildlife in America. Urban and suburban encroachment, invasive species, the rush to develop energy on public and private conservation areas, competition for water, and a public that's increasingly removed from the natural world all represent enormous challenges as we seek to protect the diversity of habitats and wildlife that make up America's unique natural heritage. Added to these immediate threats is, of course, climate change, as we've uh, discussed which is projected to require a sea change in the way we think about sustaining species and managing habitat. In sum, the Refuge Improvement Act is an elegant and comprehensive tool with which to manage or respond to all these threats, including climate change. And, um, and we commend the authors uh, for such a prescient piece of legislation. With the Act, the Fish and Wildlife Service provide a clear set of management, uh, is provided a clear set of management priorities that go beyond simply managing lands and waters within refuge boundaries. Instead, it makes it clear the Secretary of Interior has an obligation to seek clear, uh, seek comprehensive conservation strategies with private landowners, the states, and other federal landholders, uh, in effect, looking beyond refuge boundaries. Uh, this all in an effort to secure the biological integrity of refuges and achieve the mission and purposes of uh, each refuge in the system. Uh, along those lines, the value of integrating objectives in the refuge comprehensive conservation plans, which of course are mandated under the Improvement Act and state wildlife action plans really can't be overstated, uh, specifically as we're looking to conserve ecosystems, which we understand to be more and more important. Yet while these mandates are complete and surprisingly prescient, we have um, provided and uh, provide a valuable tool for refuge professionals, particularly in the areas of compatibility and appropriate use. Uh, a fundamental obstacle remains, and that is funding. And I won't beat a dead horse here, uh, but I think it's pretty clear that the refuge system is in a state of crisis, and we need to figure out how refuges are going to be funded at a level that is going to allow them to achieve uh, the guidance under the Refuge Improvement Act. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the Cooperative Alliance for Refuge Enhancement uh, has recommended $765 million in annual operations and maintenance funding as a minimum to get refuges on steady ground. Uh, we're grateful uh, to the House for approving the record $451 million uh, for FY08, and we are certainly appreciative of the members of the subcommittee for supporting uh, that number. But let me put a fine tooth on the, uh, on the crisis and, and talk about a few specific examples. Now, the Act requires refuges to be managed in a way that ensures their, biologically, their biological integrity. Yet, you look at the Potomac River refuges just across the street. They're having a Refuge Week event on Saturday. I hope everyone will choose to attend. It's always a great event. Um, but there, there are no wildlife surveys being conducted, no active ha habitat management, and the refuge manager, in his word, is hoping for the best for the eagles, herons, and hundreds of bird species uh, that utilize the three refuge complex. Hoping for the best isn't what the architects of the Refuge Improvement Act had intended. In fact, about half refuges in the system have no refuge biologist at all. The Act also mandates providing increased opportunities for wildlife-dependent recreation. 
But if we go to Minnesota, in the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge, an urban refuge adjacent to the Mall of America and the Twin Cities, I'm sure you're familiar with, funding shortfalls have limited their ability to reach out to tens of thousands of inner city school children, and as a result, they've witnessed a 13% drop in environmental education programs over the past year. Given the loss of vital refuge buffer habitat and corridors, there's an urgent need for both acquisition and cooperative agreements with private landowners. The State Wildlife Action Plans, I think, uh, uh, make it clear that there's an enormous need here. In fact, the Act requires that the Secretary plan and direct the continued growth of the system in a manner that is best designed to accomplish the mis mission of the system and contribute to the conservation of ecosystems in the United States. Mr. Chairman, no question, this is a big mandate. Um, but in our view, a whole lot more needs to be done uh, to achieve that mandate. And for instance, at the Department of Interior, uh, internal decisions to centralize the real estate appraisal system has made the process so cumbersome that we've learned from some partners uh, that they've lost acquisition uh, prospects from willing sellers because of the bureaucratic red tape. That's just an example. Uh, looking at a stunning report by the GAO just released in September, they did an exhaustive study of the prairie pothole region, which provides breeding grounds for more than 60% of our nation's migratory bird species. It found at the current rate of acquisition, it'll take the service 150 years to acquire the recommended 12 million additional acres. And that's not just acquiring, we're talking about agreements, uh, easements with private landowners and willing sellers, of course. Now, the Act also says the Secretary shall acquire under state law water rights that are needed for refuges, uh, refuge purposes. We agree with the other, uh, with Secretary Browner and, uh, of course, uh, Secretary, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Ms. Browner, uh, former administrator and Secretary uh, Babbitt, that uh, that's a real need. And uh, what we found is that in many instances, the service simply hasn't acquired the rights which are vital to achieving their mission. And in fact, because of staffing shortages, water needs at refuges, particularly in the East, are unknown. In the words of one refuge professional, we are, quote, looking at a uh, slow motion car crash as portions of refuges are drying up and they don't know why. In the face of this, Mr. Chairman, we ask the commi uh, committee to commission an independent evaluation of what is needed in terms of funding and actions by the Secretary to comply with the Refuge Improvement Act. Refuges are a cornerstone of conservation in America. If we're going to protect our nation's wildlife heritage for the benefit of future generations, then funding and political capital must be allocated to successfully carry out the Improvement Act of 1997. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hershey. Thank you for your uh, testimony, your insight, and uh, your leadership uh, on, on this issue. Next, we're going to turn to John Frampton, Director of South Carolina DNR, and delighted we were able to find a spot in the panel for, for a state's perspective. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share perspectives of the Association on the implementation of the Improvement Act. I am John Frampton, Director of the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and also Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, all 50 states are members of the association. In short, we conclude that yes, the promise of the Act is well on the way to be fulfilled. The Act has truly met its goals as organic legislation for the refuge system, directing the Fish and Wildlife Service to manage the system to ensure the sustainability of fish and wildlife and where compatible, appropriately allow for the use and enjoyment of those resources by our citizens. While funding inadequacies constrain meeting the full potential of the Act, the Service's commitment to its statutory obligations under the Act remains solid and unwavering. The State Fish and Wildlife Agencies sincerely appreciate the Service's engagement of our agencies in all aspects of implementing the Act. The Association and the 50 individual State Fish and Wildlife Agencies have a longstanding interest and involvement in the refuge system and its contribution to fish, wildlife, and habitat conservation. We were instrumental in the deliberations leading to the passage of the Act and in assisting in the drafting of the implementing policies. Hunting, fishing, and other wildlife-dependent recreational uses on National Wildlife Refuges are deeply valued by hunters, anglers, and outdoor enthusiasts because of the tremendous opportunities refuges provide, especially in areas where public lands are limited, such as in South Carolina. As an example of the success on the ground, the Department and the Service have enjoyed a longstanding and successful relationship in managing wildlife resources and providing compatible wildlife-dependent recreational programs 
that cross both state and federal properties. This relationship began evolving decades ago when both agencies realized that the management of wildlife resources needed to be addressed at an ecosystem level. An even stronger partnership developed in 1989 with the initiation of the ACE Basin Project, a cooperative habitat conservation project involving public, private, and corporate partners. This partnership quickly led to the establishment of a new national wildlife refuge in South Carolina, the ACE Basin. With the passage of the Improvement Act, the Department and the Service have worked cooperatively with nonprofit organizations in that project area to protect over 170,000 acres of coastal habitat through fee simple acquisition and donated conservation easements. And as a result of the passage of the Act, we've strengthened cooperative agreements that allow for equipment exchange and staff assistance on state and federal properties. We now coordinate many hunt schedules, particularly those that involve the mobility impaired in our youth. Department staff is actively participating in the development of the CCPs for all eight refuges in South Carolina, and we're extremely excited about the opportunity to partner with the service on implementation of these plans to produce on-the-ground habitat improvements and enhance public recreation. We believe that by working cooperatively, sharing our resources and our talents, we can accomplish what no single entity could even envision. And it seems evident that the Fish and Wildlife Service has taken to heart Congress's direction regarding cooperation with state fish and wildlife agencies in implementing the Act. The Service has comprehensively engaged state fish and wildlife agencies in the development and review of regulations implementing the Act. While the state agencies and service have not always agreed on certain implementing policies, we have been able to arrive at consensus in a vast majority of circumstances. This benefits not only fish, wildlife, and habitat resources supported by the refuges, but also the public that we all strive to serve. And let me reflect just a bit on the development of the CCPs. As we advocated during the legislative drafting, and as the law reflects, the service should take maximum advantage of state developed plans and strategies for species and habitats throughout the development of the CCPs. The utility of this approach is even more evident with the recent completion by every state fish and wildlife agency of its state wildlife action plan for species in need of conservation and the initiation of the National Fish Habitat Initiative. In addition to these strategies, the states have all developed statewide goals, plans, and objectives for many additional species and for wildlife-dependent recreational opportunities. Continued close and meaningful cooperation between the service and the state fish and wildlife agencies will ensure that the development of a CCP is the most thorough, efficient, and effective way. With respect to the system maintenance and growth in light of budget shortfalls, cooperation with state fish and wildlife, wildlife agencies can help budget shortfalls, but states need to be engaged at the early stage. A collective discussion between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the state agency can reflect on what respective agencies have what capability and resources to continue effective administration of the individual refuge to meet both its mission and its contribution to the conservation objectives of the state Fish and Wildlife Agency. Mr. Chairman, in South Carolina, we value our partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service very highly, and we believe that we have accomplished a tremendous amount of success that cooperative partnership, and we look forward to that in the future, as do all the states that are members of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frampton. Thank you for your testimony uh, uh, today. And finally, we turn to the Honorable William Horn, General Counsel, the United States Sportsmen's Alliance. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, my name is William Horn, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear today, both on behalf of the U.S. Sportsmen's Alliance and as a former Interior Department alum to discuss the landmark 1997 Refuge Improvement Act. And uh, passage of that act was a high priority of the Alliance uh, 10 years ago, and we have maintained a keen interest in the act and, of course, the refuge system. And I think as all recognize, that system's an incomparable array of wildlife habitats that provide unparalleled conservation benefits and opportunities for public use, especially hunting and fishing. I'd like to briefly talk about where the 1997 Act came from. Mr. Young and Mr. Babbitt made some references to it. The controversy surrounded the system in the early 90s. Uh, animal rights radicals were ratcheting up their campaigns, political and legal, to exclude hunters and anglers from the system. 
Another refuge lawsuit was just settled at that point that threatened to impose additional obstacles to hunting and other forms of wildlife dependent recreation. Funding for the system was being curtailed, impacting both conservation management as well as public access. And finally, earlier versions of refuge organic legislation or bills had been introduced which would have made it more difficult for the service to maintain traditional hunting and fishing and opportunities on the system. And from the perspective of the sporting and conservation community, that was a pretty grim period. In early 1995, the, our community uh, approached the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus and the then new congressional leadership about comprehensive refuge legislation that would fix these problems. And the result was H.R. 1675 introduced in the 104th Congress and its primary sponsors were Mr. Young, Representative John Dingell, and Representative Bill Brewster, then from Oklahoma. Now, that effort didn't succeed that Congress, but uh, carried over into the next year. New legislation was introduced, and uh, Secretary Babbitt indicated uh, concerted good faith negotiations with Secretary Babbitt. And I would say some of us thought he was the Darth Vader in the process rather than me. Uh, yielded H.R. 1420 that was introduced and ultimately passed and signed into law 10 years ago today. Now, a critical feature of that act is its express recognition that hunting and fishing were and are important and legitimate activities on refuge units. In addition, once determined to be compatible, the service under the law is under a clear statutory duty to facilitate those activities, not just merely allow them. And these provisions were designed to stop once and for all repeated litigation by animal rights radicals seeking to bar hunters and other users from the refuge system. And unfortunately, such litigation continues today under different and new procedural guises. The Sportsman's Alliance considers the 97 Act to be a success. Its focus on wildlife conservation and management is consistent with the principles articulated by President Roosevelt when he created the system in 1903. And this focus demonstrates that refuge units are not mere sanctuaries to be set aside and left alone, but to be actively managed. And that has resulted in hunters now having access to over 300 units of the system. In addition, the political unity formed, forged during the 1995-97 period translated into renewed emphasis on the system and increased funding for refuges, uh, uh, for funding for operations and maintenance. And these beneficial trends peaked in 2003, coincident with the system centennial. Now, unfortunately, there are a few skunks at the picnic. The animal rights interests unwilling to accept the clear policies in the 97 Act have continued to mount legal challenges. Three years ago, they sued to stop hunting on 36 refuge units, arguing that the Fish and Wildlife Service was obligated to prepare comprehensive environmental impact statements in addition to the CCPs. Others joined, the USSA and others joined the suit with the service, tried to argue that the CCPs and all the migratory bird analysis that's done were all fully sufficient to cover the bases. Unfortunately, the court disagreed and has ordered the service to prepare EISs, which it's now doing, wasting finite dollars and wasting finite staff resources. And this is one issue where we think Congress needs to redress the matter to save the service from all this useless paperwork to fulfill the purposes of the 97 Act. Uh, despite these types of problems and issues, I think the Alliance remains proud of its role in helping to enact the 97 Act and believe if the funding issues can be resolved, the promise of this landmark legislation can truly be fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn. I want to thank all our witnesses today for your testimony and uh, your time. I also want to thank my colleagues who have joined us recently on the panel, starting with Ranking Member Brown. Thank you, sir, for coming. Mr. Kildee and Mr. Fenling Wolfoega for being here. Uh, let me start uh, the round of questions by getting back to what I alluded to in my opening comment, and maybe, Mr. Hall, you can take it first, but I, I appreciate your opening statement in regards to some of the youth activities involved, because we do face, I think, a real serious crisis and challenge. Mr. Young and I were just chatting about it, and I brought with me here today an article that appeared in the Washington Post on June 19th of this year titled, Getting Lost in the Great Indoors. Mm -hmm how kids are getting addicted to the TVs, the computers, the Game Boys, what have you, and we're not getting them out and not getting them outside experiencing na nature, let alone visiting some of these great public lands of ours. And I know you've been actively involved in trying to ramp up the youth education programs, and I think you wrote a very nice article on the uh, July-August refuge update 
uh, newsletter that you sent out talking about that, but if you could maybe uh, talk a little bit more about what programs specifically we're doing to reach our children, because if we can't sustain this, and these public lands of ours, we are mere stewards of, we are to take care of them and pass them on to future generations, but if that future generation doesn't have the same love or passion or interest in the outdoors or, or in the refuge system, it's going to be awfully tough to sustain anything that we're talking about uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you for, for those comments, because as you and I have talked, this is really important. And I guess I'll start off by saying that none of what we're talking about today matters at all if we don't recruit new conservationists for two or three generations from now. No one will care. And while we're very dedicated, all of the people probably in this room are dedicated to that, uh, we need to understand that we have to actively recruit conservationists. Now, that doesn't mean fish and wildlife biologists. That means getting conservation in the hearts of our citizenry. Because if, if conservation lives at all, it only lives in the hearts of the people. And so what we've been trying to do is to understand that we missed uh, a large gap in the system. Uh, even people my age, and I grew up in the 60s, uh, and I remember it, so I must have been square. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of, of my age class people got accustomed to writing letters and because these wonderful laws were passed, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and, and, and began to think uh, it's, it's okay just to say go regulate it instead of go fix it. And uh, the conservation mind is if something is broken, go fix it. And uh, we don't have enough connection in our children to nature today. It's frightening to me that if we don't get them connected, and it is part of their spirit, they just don't know it yet. And the literature tells us if we get them connected that we have them for life. Then we'll have those, those future generations. And if we don't, we won't. And the literature is also indicating in other fields, in the medical field and psychiatric field, uh, that children, uh, the early onset of juvenile diabetes is taking on epidemic proportions. Why? It could be because children aren't physically playing anymore. They're sitting still, pushing their thumb is the strongest thing they have. Uh, we, we also uh, have seen the literature talk about um, the, the, the child psychology and medical treatment area and ADD. And we had a professor talk to us, a teacher, that said, I can take a classroom full of ADD children and I cannot keep their attention for more than five or ten minutes, but I can take them out on a field trip and let them play for an hour, unstructured, let them go discover and, and bring them back in the classroom and I can keep their attention for an hour. So there's really something there that a lot of the other fields are feeling, and so we're, we're going to do our part, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to make very sure that refuges are a welcoming place for, for Mr. Children. Hall, let me just follow up. Uh, uh, last week, the other hat I wear around this place, at least in this session, is co-chairing the uh, Congressional Sportsmen's Caucus, and we organized the first ever Congressional Sportsmen's Week here in Congress last week with resolutions that we passed and some briefings, the annual banquet uh, that we have uh, every year. But we also had a breakfast briefing last week, and we brought in people from Matthews Bow and uh, to talk about the archery in the schools program and the Kicking Bear Archery Camp uh, that Gander Mountain has been supporting nationwide. And uh, uh, it is true that unless we do a better job and think creatively on how to get these kids connected to the outdoors and appreciation for uh, our natural resources, we are going to be in trouble. Because as someone who grew up who loved to hunt and fish in western Wisconsin, some of the greatest conservationists I know, and, and those who are quickest to open up their wallets are those out there participating, whether it's hunting, fishing, or just getting outdoors and understanding the beauty and what needs to be preserved. And now in light with childhood obesity, type 2 juvenile diabetes, this all meshes. But we've got to think, think of ways that make it interesting for kids. And what's interesting today is technology. And I'm wondering if the service is tapping into some programs that utilize uh, technology in order to, to get the kids interested. Yes, sir, we are. Uh, we have um, uh, treasure hunts where they have to use GPS um, to, to go find. They have to follow the instructions in a, in a, a GPS program uh, to reach the point where they can find the, 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 the prize. Uh, we, we take them out on, uh, uh, and let them do their own filming 
uh, we get cameras from uh, Nikon and Kodak, and they, they, they volunteer them. And we take kids out and let them take digital cameras, come back and uh, take digital pictures, come back and put them on a screen and compare notes on how, how you took pictures. It is important not to leave their world behind, but to use it as a bridge. So we're, we're going to be trying that and a whole lot of other things to try and get them interested in the outdoors. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Uh, Mr. Young. Thank you, and, and Mr. Hall, I appreciate your statement. Um, but I think to get everybody involved in conservation, there's so many different groups that have different interpretations. In this room, we have probably PETA, uh, we have Defenders of Wildlife, uh, I can go on down the line. There's about 76 different organizations, and they don't want to see the big picture. They have their own little, little fiefdom to take and generate. Uh, I like to respect everybody's beliefs and have them enjoy it uh, collectively together on their refuges. The hunting and fishing and trapping to me is extremely important. The bird watching and identification and the floor and everything else is extremely important. But there's a division within the organization and you can take preservationists and take and drown them all as far as I'm concerned. Conservation is different. But unfortunately the movement has been taken over by the preservationist group and makes your job very difficult. Uh, Mr. Hershey, I, 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 I was interested, you wanted to purchase more land, 12 million more acres of land. How do you go about doing that when you have a $2.5 million, uh, billion dollar backlog in maintenance and $1.25 billion in operation backlog and three, six, one million in invasive backlog? How are you going to, remember my statement, how are you going to go out and buy a new house when your plumbing doesn't work in the one you got? Mr. Young, I think there are, yeah, it's an excellent question, but I think there are a number of ways you need to look at the problem. First of all, there are the mandates in the Improvement Act. And I think fundamentally, there is a pretty sweeping mandate to protect ecosystems as a way of ensuring the integrity of refuges. And within that, we recognize there are, you know, the states recognize through the state wildlife action plans that there are enormous needs for uh, conserving habitat. And we are not necessarily advocating for buying everything under the sun. We're talking about conserving. And uh, the GAO report was looking, for instance, specifically at the fish and wildlife plans for the prairie hot pothole re region, and most of those uh, were easements versus acquisitions. Regardless, you couldn't, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. We need more money to protect habitat, and that means involving private landowners, that means in involving the states, that means uh, federal dollars as well. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there is the ongoing question of, uh, you know, why do you go conserving more habitat when you can't take care of what you already have? And that's a refrain we frequently hear. I think our response to that is, look, uh, you know, if lands are developed, for instance, there's a proposed subdivision adjacent to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge down in Texas, uh, all over the country, you can see subdivisions cropping up on refuge boundaries, even remote <laughs> refuges or reason reasonably remote refuges like uh, Tamarack in Minnesota. People want to live next to these conservation areas. And if we are going to respond to those things, we need to recognize what the values of these places are and act, uh, well, you know, take action proactively. Well, I, I don't disagree. I'm just suggesting that, you know, uh, that we have to take care of the house. To purchase more would not take care of it with invasive species, and et cetera. We're just not gaining anything. I have another Another question, I, Ms. Hershey, that it somewhat concerns me because I'm directly related to this. Um, on page five of your testimony, you state human beings are what make conservation possible for refuges, and I agree with that. Would you agree that the current projection of reducing the refuge workforce by 20 percent will re undermine the mission of the refuge system? Absolutely. Okay. If that's the case, why has your organization, I specifically say your organization, along with PEER, has consistently opposed to letting Native American tribes operate various functions through annual funding agreements on wildlife refuges located within the boundaries of their ref, uh, reservations. In your judgment, are, are the tribes competent? Are they charging too much, or do you not agree with the fundamental goals of tribal self-governments acts? Um, the answer to that is our organization actually supports strongly the involvement of tribes in uh, working with Fish and Wildlife to manage refuges. You're probably speaking specifically about the situation at National Bison Range. Well then, uh, but, well, if that's the case, why does your organization oppose the annual funding agreement for the Bison Range Refuge? 
the annual funding agreement uh, that you're probably referring to that, uh, there. It's the only one. Well, and that funding agreement was terminated by Fish and Wildlife Service, and structurally, uh, we thought that it was deficient and uh, it didn't work for a number of reasons, but that doesn't mean we don't support the tribes working closely with Fish and Wildlife Service. Indeed, I think they have to. Uh, if you read our column in our magazine uh, a couple months ago, we talked about the need to engage diversity in this country, and this ties into the question of engaging a broader range of individuals uh, in the refuge system for conservation. Well, my interest, you know, when it comes not only the bison, because, you know, they, the, the American natives have managed in bison longer than any white men's ever been on this in this continent, and uh, they may not manage them to your uh, satisfaction, but they did manage them. I'm interested because if I find your organization opposing my attempt to get management of refuge lands in the state of Alaska wherever it's possible, no, just because everybody's sitting in, in Washington D.C. in a nice office means that they know everything about managing wildlife refuges. It's a way to employ people and to do the job correctly. You can sign contracts, which we're working on the Park Service, with covenants that allow this to occur. And if I can get the inkling that this is, you know, they can't do it, or they're not competent, they're unprepared, and by the way, that's racist. That's going to be a sad day for the agency and your organization also, because that's wrong. These are people that know the problems and can solve those problems. And I've sort of sensed that this is sort of creeping along through the agency itself, Mr. Hall, and your, your, Mr. Hinch, your, your program too. So I just suggest be very, very careful. Just keep that in mind. I yield back to balance my Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Kildee, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm blessed with uh, the Shiawassee uh, Wildlife Refuge in the state of Michigan. It's a wonderful place. and. I, whenever I go there, I myself feel that it's understaffed. So let me ask you these questions, Mr. Hershey. I, I appreciate your, your comment regarding the damaging and negative effect that the annual budget shortfalls afflict upon the ability of the Fish and Wildlife Service to fully implement the Improvement Act. The projected 20% decline in staffing levels is especially troubling to me. If those if these workforce management plans go into effect, is it possible for the Fish and Wildlife Service to fulfill its legal requirements under the Improvement Act? Uh, in our assessment, no. Uh, you have sweeping mandates in the Improvement Act, and, and the Act, again, we, we will reiterate, is a tremendously powerful and, I think, uh, elegant piece of legislation uh, that lays out a terrific set of guidelines uh, for managing national wildlife refuges now and into the future. But without adequate funding, if we don't have uh, staff at refuges, you know, we're seeing vandalism at refuges across the country so we don't have law enforcement. We are, um, you know, as an example, Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge this past weekend, they were expecting 600 people to attend their refuge week event. They received 2,000 people. Were they staffed to handle this? No, they weren't. Refuges, half the refuges uh, across the country are un, uh, have no biologists. Uh, many have no staff at all. I don't, I don't understand how we're able to implement this act uh, fully unless we meet some of the fundamental funding needs for the refuge system. In my experience uh, at the Shiawassee Refuge in, in Michigan, uh, these people are really hardworking people and are sometimes doing a job and a half for, for, for one salary. They're not of shirking their responsibility. And, you know, the Improvement Act is a, a very important act, but the Improvement Act is something like a, um, use this analogy, a, a get well card. It kind of indicates what we would want and, and what we, how we a, evaluate, how we value these. And if I have a friend who is ill, I will send a, a get well card. But what my friend really needs is the Blue Cross card. And that's the appropriation. And I think Congress very often is good at sending the, the get well card, but doesn't send the, the Blue Cross card. I, you know, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I also want to make a point of, of um, discussing the role of volunteers and friends uh, at refuges around the country. Currently, friends and volunteers are committing or, or contributing fully 20 percent 
of the workload on our national wildlife refuges. I, I'm humbled by the commitment and the support, but I'm appalled that we are relying so heavily on volunteers uh, to do the work uh, that many professionals uh, should be tasked to do. Um, and one other comment just related to the issue of um, uh, reaching out to children and families. You know, it's interesting, you look at the refuge system compared to other federal land entities, and while they may be, in the words of, I think, uh, Secretary Babbitt, um, postage stamps on the landscape, at least in the lower 48, obviously, not Alaska, these places provide the best opportunity, in our view, of any federal entity to engage the public, particularly diverse communities, because so many of these refuges are located in coastal areas, they're near urban areas, and we have an opportunity to engage diverse communities of all kinds uh, to get them excited about conservation. And I feel like that's an opportunity that we're missing and we need to put real resources into. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hall, uh, what's the status of the uh, annual funding agreement uh, for the Silesia Kootenai tribes? Uh, we've been told by the tribes that uh, Deputy Secretary Scarlett has ordered an agreement to be developed, but uh, to date, uh, this has not occurred. Uh, could you tell us why it's not occurred? Uh, we made a proposal uh, for a, a funding agreement or for an, for an agreement uh, to the tribe uh, a couple of months ago and have not uh, really uh, had them re-engage into the discussion negotiation process. Well, I, I would encourage both sides, including yourself especially, to, to re-engage. I think this is a very important uh, step and I, I would encourage you to do that. I just uh, would like to follow up on something that uh, Evan Hershey said a minute ago. Uh, this really has nothing to do with whether or not we're working with tribes or with anyone else. That's not the issue. Uh, we think the tribes can be very valuable working with us on the refuge. But the previous funding agreement was, in my opinion, structured to fail. Uh, there were two complete pillars of uh, authority. No one was totally in charge of the refuge, and you can't run a refuge that way. Uh, someone has to be in charge if they're accountable, and there has to be one team that works together, not two that are just out there kind of working. So I've been suggesting very strongly that we have one team working together that's composed of, of tribal members and Fish and Wildlife Service members, but the refuge manager has to be in charge of the refuge. Somebody has to be accountable. I thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Kildee. Now it's my pleasure to be able to recognize Ranking Member Brown for any comments or questions that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Kine, and thank you, gentlemen, for coming, and particularly uh, pleased to see my friend John Frampton from South Carolina, who has DNR there, and uh, not only does he have that responsibility, but he's been very active in uh, setting aside lots of different uh, lands for uh, for future future enjoyment and and prevent future development, John. I'm glad to glad to have you and thank you for your service there. Uh, so my my question, I guess, is I represent you know the coastal area of South Carolina, which is uh, the 21st largest congressional district now in the nation because of all the the growth. Um, and I'm a you know, I have 1,500 acres that join the Francis Mayer National Forest, so we're grateful for uh, the national forest and for the, you know, the other reserves that we have set aside. But my concern is, and I think it was addressed earlier, about whether they were, what kind of a use would the public be able to enjoy, whether it be able to use for fishing or hunting or hiking or, or some of the other areas. It seems like to me, when we, pr we propose a, a reserve, it almost becomes a wilderness area. We, we don't want much activity. In fact, my major concern is uh, along the strip in the uh, Waccamaw Reserve, about, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 miles, John, you can uh, attest to this. Uh, with that growth in that area, they don't want us to build highways. They don't want us to build, um, you know, any kind of uh, infrastructure or utilities in in these set aside uh, reserves, is, could could you give me some insight on that? I mean, 
it seems though the, the taxpayers of all the taxpayers actually paid for that particular property and they ought to have some enjoyment particularly ought to have some community interests of use uh, thank you mr brown it's good to see you again <clears throat> you know that is one of the uh, dilemmas that we deal with um, and you can say it's a good thing you can say it's a bad thing but uh, when a refuge is established, there is a primary purpose for which it's established. It may be waterfowl, it could be endangered species, a myriad of different uh, reasons for establishing a national wildlife refuge. And then after that, anything that happens on refuge lands must be found to be compatible with that primary purpose. And then in addition to that, the Improvement Act identified priority uses or priority appropriate uses, the hunting, the fishing, the the photography and, and, uh, uh, and education and information, et cetera, those six. We call them the big six. I refer to them as the big seven because it always starts with wildlife first, no matter even if it's an appropriate use and even if uh, you've got to go to make sure it's a compatible use to, to see that it, it, uh, uh, it fits with the purposes of the refuge and for wildlife first. Uh, these lands are unique in being set aside for wildlife and for public's use of wildlife. They're, they're the only lands like them in the world that I'm aware of uh, from a federal standpoint. And the law basically was negotiated through to say, uh, we need to hold on to that. So roads going through a refuge uh, typically cause us a problem uh, because uh, it's not uh, one of those things that, uh, that contributes to the purposes of the refuge. Uh, if there are emergency situations, um, you know, I'm sure that, that things can be discussed on an emergency basis, but we do face this, and the law is pretty clear in my mind as to what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do administratively. Well, and that, I guess that brings my major concern is that maybe we ought to be concerned then of where we actually establish these, uh, these reserves. Uh, on this particular one I'm talking about, the Waccamaw, and John's familiar with it, uh, we have about a 30-mile stretch of land that you can't get from the ocean to the mainland unless you cross part of that reserve. And, uh, and I don't think there was ever intent for the taxpayers to buy a piece of property that's going to, going to fence the rest of the population from having a, natu a natural way to evacuate in case there's a a national disaster, disaster, particularly uh, you know, hurricane or some other, maybe tsunami or, or some other reason to move quickly across that uh, area rather than having to circumvent some 30 miles of travel. I don't think that was the intent when they established that particular parcel of land to make it so unique that only wildlife could survive and not, and not the population. Well, I. You know, I, I can only uh, tell you what we believe that the law directs us to do. And uh, we believe that, that the law tells us that once the a refuge is established, and maybe your point's well taken, if that's a consideration that needs to be looked at as we establish refuges, uh, what might be the future needs uh, out there, uh, then, you know, that can be debated and talked about as we move forward. We have a very long process that we go through to establish a refuge. But once we do, uh, in my opinion, the law guides us in how we're supposed to handle that refuge and what we're allowed to uh, uh, permit and what we're not. And roads have historically been a significant issue, especially since the passage of the Improvement Act. Then maybe we ought to take a look at some special legislation to at least maybe in case the population is endangered, um, let's, we ought to be able to have some way to exclude that, not on a not on a regular type basis, but on special instances, and we ought to have some kind of an easy way to move through it rather than upset the whole, you know, uh, population that we're doing something to, you know, to, I guess, uh, damage a special piece of property that's been set aside. I don't, I don't know that you know, if the taxpayers involved, that all the taxpayers ought to have some benefit from it, and we maybe we ought to look, take a look at it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Frampton, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and to respond to Congressman Brown there, um, in, in that area, the, the state recently acquired some 32,000 acres um, 
of, of land under a deal with International Paper Company and some of our conservation partners. And we actually made concessions on some of that prior to the time that we acquired that property. There's been a tremendous amount of miscommunication in that Myrtle Beach area relative to some of these uh, land acquisitions. But I think, Congressman, most of the issues that uh, you, you're referencing, we've had an opportunity to sit down with a delegation in, in Horry County and I believe work through most, most of those issues. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, John. I appreciate you saying that because if, if, there, if there is some reason maybe we need to at least address it in the legislature. Maybe this this might be something we need to uh, to address while we're looking at expanding. You know the re the potential of creating you know what is 12 million more acres of the uh, of this wildlife. But I, I know you've been actively involved in the community for a long, long time, and um, I'm grateful that something has been worked out because we really it's a you know it's, it's a major concern for the safety of those people living along the coast there. A lot of that was addressed on the uh, I-73 corridor issue, and a lot of that debate was relative to the heritage preserve that is uh, owned by DNR, not U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we recently came to agreement with the Department of Transportation, so I think that situation is corrected. Good thing. Sandy Island was in included. Uh, Sandy Island is, is currently held by the Nature Conservancy. Um, we were involved in that deal. I think ultimately you may see some of Sandy Island go under the refuge system. Um, as, as you know, some of our lands are actually in the refuge system under an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service where we've actually um, allocated those lands for their management where it's more compatible with the refuge than in our individual individual lands. But I, I don't know of any issue associated with road construction that's, uh, that's an issue right now with Sandy Island. It's, it's none. I just I, I only mentioned Sandy Island because I knew it was part of the ongoing um, preservation there to maybe include it into the reserve system. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hamp Frampton. Uh, Eni, thank you for joining us. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership and uh, certainly for the contributions that you've made, not only for the conservation of our national wildlife system, and uh, certainly appreciate having this hearing this afternoon. Also, our distinguished ranking member, General from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Brown, for, for his leadership as well. I uh, <clears throat> was listening with, uh, uh, certainly want to express my appreciation to the, to the uh, statements that have been made before our subcommittee. I'm sorry I did uh, miss earlier the former Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Uh, uh, Babbitt's uh, presence in his presentation. It's an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves as a country. It always seems that uh, if you're a conservationist, you're, you're a Democrat. And if you're a pro-developer, you're a Republican. And it's really unfortunate. I wish my good friend from Alaska was here because I don't think there's not one member here that does not want to, 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 to conserve the richness of our, of our nation's uh, wildlife system. And ironically, too, it was a Republican president that initiated the whole movement towards conservation of our wildlife system. So I don't think this should ever be a Republican or a Democratic issue. It should be a national issue that should have the same common interests and intent on the part of the members of Congress and as well as the administration and the public as well to do the conservation. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Hall, you noted you said that there was something wrong with the current provisions of the Improvement Act, uh, that they seem to be not working together. I was trying to catch what you meant by that. You, you mean in, in my response to Mr. Brown? Yes, I believe. No, no, it was earlier. I think it was to either Mr. Young or uh, 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 Mr. Kine's uh, question. You said something that there was, there was something, the two systems to be not working together. And I'm Oh, that was, that was in relation to the, uh, the Bison Range uh, it, discussion on an, uh, just an, an agreement on a record. Yes, and you mentioned something that, that uh, they was not working together or there's, was it because of the, of the, uh, the weakness of the, uh, of, of the current provisions of the Act? Or no, no, no. This is, that, uh, this is totally, it has nothing to do with the Act. That, that didn't. This had to do with an agreement with, with tribes to work with us on the refuge. So it really had nothing to do with the Act itself. But you're satisfied with the oh, way yes, the sir. tribes are handling it as opposed to the rest of us? I, I'm sorry? As opposed to how the federal government is dealing with other issues, dealing with... Uh, but you're saying whatever, however the tribes are, are handling the situation. Yeah, we're we're, we're working with the tribes right. now to try and, and come up with an agreement that we think uh, makes one team work on the refuge with the Fish and Wildlife Service who is responsible for the refuge uh, in charge. 
Okay. There seems to be consensus that obviously the funding seems to be the most mm -hmm. troubling aspect of however you call it. Uh, we can talk about and all the good things that have been done. And I must say that uh, I was very impressed. We're talking about some 95 million acres of lands uh, that affects the wildlife system, the, the, the refuge system, and some 547 refuges, 3,000 waterfowl areas, and the home of some 700 bird species and 220 mammals and 250 types of reptiles and, and over 200 types of fish. Now, fish is very important where I come from, obviously. Uh, and I, I, I just, just wanted to ask you, suppose that within this 95 million acres of refuge land, or whatever you want to call it, that we have sufficient supply of oil and natural gas to, to, to make us independent of any more uh, uh, oil from the Middle East or Saudi Arabia. What would be your recommendation on how we might strike a balance, uh, as my good friend from Alaska has very well, and I must say, I, I, I for one, am for development, but there's got to be a balanced approach. Uh, do you prefer that we well, disregard the, uh, the uh, nation's uh, uh, rich resources that we have that, uh, that provides for our energy needs? Uh, thank uh, you for putting me in this spot, Mr. Abercrombie. No, I didn't mean to do that. Sir. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in reality, we have literally uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of oil and gas wells today on national wildlife refuges uh, uh, throughout the country. Uh, and I think that if, if you go to those areas, Louisiana is a good, good test case because uh, they've been there for a long time. You, you have the very old ones from the old operators, the very new ones from the new operators. The footprint is significantly different today. Uh, and you can just compare the wells. So uh, I, I believe that if it is the will of the people to get the, the resource out, that it would be the responsibility of the Fish and Wildlife Service to figure out how to do that in a way that did not destroy the values of the refuge or, or undermine them to a point that was not acceptable. I'm uh, planning to hold a hearing probably in the next two weeks about global climate change as part of my committee jurisdiction. And uh, I've always wondered, uh, I know this has nothing to do with climate, <laughs> global warming, but I think it does have very serious implications in terms of how far and to what extent are we willing to conserve uh, our nation's wildlife system as opposed to development. Uh, but I, I do want to raise the issue with, with you gentlemen, that, and Mr. 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 I think you might have some comments on that. Uh, yes, Mr. Fowley Mabanga. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I think as you're, as you're uh, holding hearings and, and looking at climate change and, and energy development. And by I the way, my friend says it's not global, uh, uh, it's not global warming, it's global pollution, probably a better word that we could use to be realistic about climate change and why we need to address the issues of, of, uh, of, of emissions and, and the pollutions that we're producing in the air and, 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 our, and our resources. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Absolutely. Um, I would, uh, you know, in, in examining uh, the challenge of, of energy production and conservation, I, I think uh, an apt test case right now is North Dakota. As I think many members here and, and uh, people in this room know, North Dakota is, a, is what's often termed a uh, duck factory for America. You have something like 60 refuges up there, prairie potholes. It's tremendously important to um, uh, nesting waterfowl and a whole range of other birds, grassland species, shorebirds, and others. Uh, right now, because of the price of oil, suddenly uh, it's become a tremendous opportunity uh, to drill for oil, uh, certainly in northwest North Dakota, where you have uh, several refuges, including Lostwood and, um, and a couple others, but mostly easement lands, about a million and a half acres of easement lands up there. And we now have the technology, if you read the paper, uh, the New York Times this morning, I mean, they're drilling for oil and gas in the most remote places. The question is, do we now have the technology and the willpower uh, to be able to place uh, extraction uh, um, um, uh, facilities in places that are not uh, going to require filling potholes and other things? Because we have refuge managers right now that are going out on easement lands and asking nicely uh, oil companies to please move their pads 100 yards uh, to the left because you're going to fill a prairie pothole. Now, it's not just oil and gas. It's also wind energy. We're looking at the prospect for somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 
wind turbines in North Dakota. And these wind turbines are also being placed among potholes. And what, is, what are the ramifications for birds and other wildlife? And uh, thus far, wind power has, uh, in, in our view, gotten a pass on meeting the same uh, standards of uh, analysis and evaluation as, uh, as oil and gas extraction. And we're facing a train wreck up there if we don't approach uh, both oil and gas and wind turbine development in a way that uh, carefully assesses the impacts to wildlife um, while also addressing our energy needs in this country. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And it's my understanding that uh, Ranking Member Brown would like consent to have a written statement submitted for the record without objection. It will be included. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me, uh, Mr. Frampton, while I've got you here, I just want to get your, your feedback on your perception on how the CCP process has been working in South Carolina with the multitude of refuges that you have in that state. Uh, let me just preface it by saying that we, we face a unique situation in Wisconsin given a right of access clause that actually exists in our state constitution, which created a very contentious issue now in the development of the CCP for the upper miss. The service, based on scientific studies, wanted to establish a ladder approach to give migratory waterfowl a chance to rest without harassment, hunting, and being bothered. Um, but they were going to limit during certain times of the year certain right of access with certain things uh, in order to prevent that disturbance. Airboats is one of the issues that is very contentious. And I'm at a listening session one day and I have a bunch of duck hunters coming out screaming that why is the service prohibiting my use of the airboat and my favorite hunting grounds. Next day I'm in another county and I have a group of hunters coming out screaming at me saying why are you allowing airboats to be blasting through my, my favorite hunting. So it's, there was an inherent conflict there even within the same group of uh, duck hunters. But it's created a very controversial and contentious issue, and I'm wondering if you're uh, experiencing anything uh, uh, at your state. We haven't uh, experienced those type of issues. Um, we have a very unique uh, partnership, I think, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in South Carolina. It's, it's longstanding. It's, it's very close. Um, our staff work very close together, um, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have a situation with airboats too, but we've prohibited the use of airboats uh, in a good bit of our coast um, because of the disturbance on, on ducks. And that's our biggest issue in South Carolina. As you can imagine, duck getting to South Carolina, it's probably been harassed a little bit along the route from Canada. Mm -hmm. um, our mallards will, will circle for 30 minutes before they land. Um, but we've been able to bring consensus to uh, I think our publics, we've been able to do that by working hand in hand with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We sit at the table with the service. Um, we have staff assigned to the CCPs. We have biologists, uh, in some cases, a number of biologists assigned to work on those teams uh, through, through one of our staff. So I think it's just a matter of communicating with the public and as Dale referenced, uh, creating a team approach where that, uh, you know, we have a common agenda and we try to put a common vision out there for the public to understand. Good. Thank you, Mr. Frampton. That's good to hear. Uh, Mr. Horn, let me first thank you for your very thoughtful uh, comments and testimony here today. And you note in your statement that the Improvement Act codified in the statute a policy of public use. And as you said, that, quote, refuge units are not sanctuaries, end quote, to be set aside and left alone. By this statement, is it safe to assume that you and your organization support increases in the refuge system budget to facilitate public use? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I said, I think we noted the problems that are now afflicting the system because of the uh, funding reductions. Uh, fortunately, you know, dollars going in peaked coincident with the centennial and there's been a pretty severe backslide and I would just offer one sort of gratuitous comment here and that is uh, uh, I know we focused heavily on the refuge centennial and I had the good fortune of chairing that commission and we spent two years uh, kind of congratulating ourselves and looking to the future. Uh, I note uh, with some envy as a refuge advocate that the Park Service is beginning its centennial celebration nine years early with <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars being proposed. And I was thinking maybe we should go back and do this again and should be a little <laughs> bit more greedy than we were. Uh, but no, I think clearly the, the, the funding issue needs to be addressed. I would say one, one just other note, um, this, the refuge system has had user fee, entrance fee authority since 1987. Uh, that was passed that we negotiated when I was assistant secretary. 
it's not been used very extensively because there's not a lot of units where it works, like Sanibel Island, it works beautifully down there. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that the user community, whether it's uh, hunters, anglers, or bird watchers, there's not enough blood in that stone to really make that the source of the solution. Uh, I think that, as Mr. Young talked about earlier, we're going to, be, we're going to have to be a lot more creative in coming up with the high dollar source to get at fixing this problem over time. Well, I think we're certainly interested, and this goes to everyone here in attendance, if you have some ideas, some creative solutions as far as a dedicated funding stream to let's talk, you know, we should. You see the ramp up with the Centennial for the National Park Service right now and, and what's being done there, but and I think part of the problem is, at least with the Park Service, you've got some pretty clear boundaries and ranger stations and gates that you pass through, and you don't have that with refuge, and that's what makes it so unique and special. A lot of people are visiting our refuges, and they're not even aware that they're in a refuge uh, from time to time. So that presents some unique uh, challenges as well. Uh, but I thank you again uh, for being here. Mr. Brown, do you have anything uh, further? Look, nothing further. Just uh, this is a great exchange, and appreciate y'all being part of it. I'm sorry I was late, but uh, you know how those airlines run. Thank you so much. That's right. Any? Anything further? No. Well, again, I want to thank you all, and uh, I've stated in the past that. You know, these refuges that we have in, in the National Park Service, too, are really our monuments to civilization. You know, they are our great walls, our pyramids, our Taj Mahals, and we have a great charge facing us uh, here today, and especially the obligation for future generations. And hopefully with more concentration, uh, with the work the committee does, with the, uh, the Refuge Caucus has been created, we're going to be able to, uh, we're gonna be able to uh, figure this out uh, as we move forward. So again, I want to thank you all for, for being here. and. Yeah, which one? Okay, yeah, I want to thank the witnesses for your participation. The members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to these in, in writing. Uh, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days for these responses. If there's no further business before the subcommittee, the chairman again thanks everyone for your attendance, your testimony, and thank the members for participating. Thank you. This week, follow the latest in politics on C-SPAN 2. Look for campaign events, speeches, town hall meetings, interviews, and call-ins, 